go ahead and get the introduction okay. going. Thank you. All right, so welcome to West Virginia Wellness tonight. My name is Marnie, and I'm here to welcome you to tonight's life lecture sponsored by West Virginia Wellness Incorporated. This is May 20th, 2021. So West Virginia Wellness is a 501c3 nonprofit organization created to bring education and awareness to complementary, holistic, alternative, and integrative medicine. We do this through lectures, health fairs, and educational webinars, such as the one we're seeing tonight. You can find about, out more about West Virginia Wellness. I will put some information in the chat box for you. And you can find us on Facebook for the recording of this life lecture. As I said, it's being recorded and will be available on Facebook. The views expressed by the practitioner may not necessarily reflect those of West Virginia Wellness. We encourage our listeners to ask questions and contact practitioners directly to find out more. So our guest tonight is Linda Ann Kahn. She is a nationally certified massage therapist, a clinical aromatherapist, and a lymphedema therapist with over 30 years of experience. An integrative health coach and beauty therapist, she is also founder and director of both Beauty Clinic Day Spa, Wellness Center, and Lymphatic Therapy Services in San Diego. She specializes in the treatment of lymphedema, connective tissue disorders, post-surgical care, and Lyme disease. And she is co-author of Lymphedema and Lip Edema Nutrition Guide. With her long-standing mission and philosophy of a holistic approach, she stresses the emotional, mental, and physical connections used to bring about relaxation, health, energy, and happiness to her clients, staff, and patients. Tonight, Linda Ann will focus in on Lyme disease and the role of aromatherapy as an integrative modality. In this exciting presentation, you will learn from a hands-on expert how to incorporate aromatherapy, lymph massage, and detoxification into care. Linda Ann will discuss which oils stimulate the immune system and the role of lymphatic massage and detoxification in this treatment. Finally, she will discuss which oils improve oxygenation of the body's tissues to promote detoxification and trigger increased production of white blood cells, which can help with the devastating effects of chronic Lyme disease. So thank you again, Linda Ann, for agreeing to share your expertise with us. And you may begin. Thank you so much for the invitation. And it is a pleasure to be here. Let's just get the screen here, over here. And we'll share that. And then we'll just get it. Over. And if everybody can make sure that they would mute their mics. Here we go. Thank you. Okay. So it's an absolute pleasure to be here. And the subject that I'm gonna be talking about today, it, it, it's a, a very, very important subject. It's something that needs to be spoken about on the rooftops. It needs to be shared because I don't know if any of you are aware, but when somebody has Lyme disease, the doctors do not take any notice, the regular doctors. And in fact, when you go and you try and get treatment and you say it's Lyme disease, you probably won't get treatment. So my patients will say they have fibromyalgia or other conditions, and then they get treatment. So it's really the untold story and it's really an invisible disease. So when I work with my patients, I work with the patients who already have a Lyme literate doctor. If they don't have a Lyme literate doctor, I help them to find one, either in our area or outside in different parts of the country. And it's a very integrative approach with what the what the doctor is doing and then what I can do. And what I stress in my work is I work with 
aromatherapy. And as Marni was saying, my approach to all of my work, but with Lyme in particular, we address the psychological effects of the client, the physical effects, the emotional and the spiritual, they get a lot of amazing support. But I do work with the lymphatic system, which we're going to talk about today, and incorporate aromatherapy into that. And so what is Lyme disease? Yeah, it comes from a tick. You can be walking in the woods and you can be bitten by ticks. And if that tick is an infected tick, and we're going to go into detail about that, you could indeed get Lyme. But Lyme is really a general term because there are many co-infections that come with Lyme disease. There's a lot of research that's going on right now with Lyme disease. I've attended several amazing conferences in the last six months because we could do things online. I was able to attend um, lots. One was completely research oriented. And tonight I am going to present some research to you that has been taking place on aromatherapy and Lyme disease. So here we go. We're going to talk about what is Lyme and how do we treat it. I'm going to talk about the ability of different essential oils to kill the persistent form of Lyme disease. The persistent form, and we'll talk about that, is the chronic Lyme. And as according to the CDC, Lyme disease can actually be treated in six weeks. You get six weeks of antibiotic and then you're treated and you're cured. But in fact, most people don't even know during that six weeks whether they have been bitten or that they have Lyme. And so it usually takes months and years to be diagnosed. And so then we call it chronic Lyme. And then as we'll see, it becomes a whole, like a deck of cards just going down where it starts to affect the entire system. We'll also talk about, can we eradicate this Bergdorfi uh, bacteria at low concentrations of essential oils? We're gonna learn about some published findings on the effectiveness of certain essential oils. And we'll find out about co-infections and how to treat them using aromatherapy and other integrative methods and generally integrative care for the Lyme patient. And I will be touching on the lymphatic system, which is so important. So what is post Lyme and how do we treat it? When you use essential oils, what do you need to take? How much do you need to take? Can you take it internally? Should it be micro encapsulated? What's the best way to deliver? And the importance of the lymphatic system, immunity and brain function. And hopefully at the end of this talk, you will have a knowledge about all of this. Those are my objectives. And the brain is, function is really important with Lyme patients because they get what they call a brain fog. And especially if they have been infected with Babesia, which is one of the co-infections. So I was contacted about two years ago by a, an online magazine and to, they were asking me, do essential oils kill Lyme? Robert Tisserand was interviewed in that particular uh, article. And one of the doctors who I later found out is doing the research at Duke University. And the answer is no, essential oils can't kill Lyme. Lyme is such a multifaceted approach. And I would never, ever make such a blanket statement. However, we can use essential oils, which you will see today, to support many aspects of the person and of the co-infections that things that are going on. So what is Lyme? It is one of the fastest growing infectious diseases in the US and Western Europe. And it's present in North America, Europe, and in Asia. And the CDC has found more than 329,000 new cases were contracted each year in the US. And those are the cases that are reported. I have patients coming to me with chronic illness and unknown illness. And it's been so many times that I have said to them, I want you to be tested for Lyme and they do have Lyme disease. Some of them they get tested and it's negative and we'll talk about the testing but eventually they find that it that is what it is so the the, the cases actually are more than that and 
It's in Western Europe. It's also um, in endemic proportions over there. I was supposed to be speaking on Lyme disease last year in Slovenia. Um, so I looked up these, uh, the information about Slovenia and the, the lecture was, the, the, the conference was canceled because of COVID, but we had a fantastic online conference with people from, I think, 50 different countries. And so I had looked up all the information about Lyme disease in those countries. And so they, in, in Slovenia, it's very high, 135 cases per 100,000. And in Austria is one of the highest rates in Europe. And then the tick populations are moving further north in latitude. And then in the US, in North America, it's caused by an infection with the spirochet bacterium, which is called the Borrelia burgdorferi. And it results in an early localized skin infection called erythema migrans. And you can see that in the picture of, over here on this page. However, that is not always found. Most of my patients do not ever remember being bitten by a tick. And they may not even have been in the woods. They may have lived in an endemic area, uh, Connecticut or Northern California. Um, but the ticks are moving now. And we had the Bay Lime Alliance give us an amazing talk here just before COVID. And they were saying that the reason that the Lyme is spreading is birds are carrying, uh, carrying the ticks to other areas. And also in our area here in San Diego, all of the open land has been filled and it's been built. And so the rodents and all the um, uh, creatures that might eat up the, the tick are not there, they've been displaced. So Lyme is now very, very prevalent here in San Diego and in Southern California as well. So it's not just Connecticut and New York, it's other areas as well. And in the Northeastern US and the Midwestern, we have the black legged tick is the main one that, that is here. Over 4 million cases confirmed since 1982. That's crazy, isn't it? And the symptoms continue after their initial antibiotic treatment. If they've been lucky enough to have been diagnosed in those first six weeks, they can have antibiotics and usually will be okay, but many of them will, it will emerge later. But most of the patients do not get treated in the beginning. And we'll go over some of the symptoms, but this little picture is showing a very, very sad man with hearing loss, paralysis of the, of the face, heart complications, flu-like symptoms, insomnia, they have terrible insomnia, swollen and painful joints, psychological compli complications, oh my goodness, the, it's, it's crazy making. And then there can be a rash going on. And my patients look very dejected, but the sad thing is that sometimes they look okay. They look fine. So their family and their friends just think that maybe they're just making this up. Um, so what is Lyme? It's transmitted from the bite of the black-legged or deer tick. So it's a tick that comes from a deer. It's the most common vector-borne disease in the USA. And the ticks collect the bacteria when they bite diseased mice or birds. And I'm gonna show you a picture in a little bit. And then when that tick attaches to you, it can transfer the spirochet called the Bergdorfi. And you see some pictures there of the black legged ticks. Some of them, the little nymph ticks are so small that they just look like the size of a little tiny, little, tiny, little dot that you may not even know that it's there at all. And there you can see the small rodents. They are reservoirs for this Bergdorfi uh, spirochet. And when the tick becomes infected from feeding on the mouse and remains infected, it changes to a nymph and then to an adult. And those are then transmitted to other mice and to humans, which become the hosts. The deer are hosts, but they're not reservoirs. They don't attach there. They just are on the on the um, on the on the adults um, on on the deer. 
um, but they don't actually take any infections from them. So they're not a reservoir, whereas the rodent is the reservoir. The bacteria can also be spread by other insects. And Dr. Dietrich Klinghart, who is in Seattle, is, I believe, one of the leading researchers for Lyme disease. And he has a center in, um, uh, connect, not connect, connect in, in um, I just said the word where he is. And he has a center there and they do the most incredible work. And he was the first one who said that these can be spread by mosquitoes or spiders or fleas, not only by ticks. And then you get something called multiple systemic infectious disease syndrome, which is called MSIDS. And Dr. Richard Horowitz spoke about that. And I have several of his books. This is one that says, why can I not get better? Why can't I get better by Dr. Horowitz? It's a very, very good book to read in such detail. But there can be overlapping medical problems that contribute to this. And we now call it chronic illness. And from the ladies that I met tonight, I can see each one of you being able to play a part to help patients with Lyme disease through all of these illnesses that they have and the emotional um, effects that they have. And the parasympathetic or fungal infections, there are allergies, environmental toxicity, compromised immune system, and POTS, which is postural orthostatic tachycardia syndrome. Um, and we can discuss that later if anyone wants to ask me questions about POTS. Um, I, I worked with a lady in England for about a year and a half. Uh, she actually read the article that was written about Lyme, where they asked, can aromatherapy cure Lyme? And I worked with her online um, for about a year and a half. And she has very, very bad environmental toxicity. So she, even when she's on her computer, it's really bad. There's only one area in her house where they have that because she's so bad with all the radiation and it's hard for her even going out into the stores. So what happens, they get infected by the tick and then it starts to become other infections and a help and, a, a, and the immune system. Um, I cannot see the questions in the chat. So maybe if Jennifer sees them and gathers them, I'll take a little bit of a break, um, you know, maybe in about 20 minutes and we can have questions. So what is chronic Lyme or this multiple systemic infectious disease syndrome that was coined, the name coined by Richard Horowitz? It's caused by a weak immune system. Now listen to this carefully. Damaged cellular function, uncontrolled bacterial infections throughout the body and other environmental triggers such as mold and parasites. Most of the patients have mold or black mold. Many of them have parasites and many of them have triggers from the environment. A lot of them have POTS. Um, they all have joint problems and problems with concentrating, which you can imagine all of this can cause severe emotional depression. And conventional medicine doesn't even recognize the possibility of these parasitic infections. And the standard round of antibiotics is ineffective towards solving the problem. Now, most of the Lyme literate physicians, most of them do work with antibiotics, but many of them will pulse the antibiotics because Lyme recognizes and they'll go and hide. So the antibiotic needs to be changed and pulsed two weeks on, two weeks off. Another antibiotic coming in the problem with that, it's not really good for the gut. And as most of you ladies know, how important the gut microbiome is. And if you have so many antibiotics, what are you doing to that gut microbiome? But the standard is with antibiotics, even with the Lyme literate doctors. Dr. Klinghart does not use antibiotics. He uses lots of herbs and many, many other things. You could go onto his website, Dr. Klinghart. Hey, Jennifer. And it's the Sophia Institute is his center up in Seattle. 
So in, if we want to cure Lyme disease naturally, and I don't know if we ever actually cure Lyme disease, we actually put everything into remission. And the best is we hope that the patient can get on with their normal life. I have a patient that I worked with for five years and she was sick for seven. And she went through so many treatments and finally had her teeth, the cavitations in her teeth removed. She went to uh, Switzerland. It, everything she did helped. And finally, that was the final trigger that she was able to go into remission. She then married her um, a person she was engaged to, and then they had a baby. And the baby is now a year, almost a year and a half, and she's actually doing okay. When she was coming to me, I thought she would never, ever get better. And she was 28 when she came to me for the first time. Um, she'd had a vaccine when she'd entered college um, and things started to trigger from that. Also working very, very hard through her training at college. And then she went to work um, in a financial company where they were working her six days a week. And then, so this, she, she was feeling sick already. And then she went to a wedding in Connecticut. So you can see the immune system was already compromised. Things were set in place. And she went to a wedding in Connecticut and came back and, had, and got ill. So that's a very sad story, but one that we hear a lot. But the focus we want to do is to improve overall health, not to kill the disease. And that's really what my practice is all about, working on improving overall health. We've got to make lifestyle changes, be patient and persistent and never, ever give up. And that's where the practitioners come in. Because yes, we're doing all the work that can help, but we also need to support and be encouraged. And that's where my work as a health coach comes in. You keep on encouraging the patient and supporting them through everything because they are not believed by many, many people in society, which is really sad. This is a picture that was drawn by a patient. And I got this from a website where there were many, many pictures of patients. And at one of the conferences that I attended a few months ago, they shared art that Lyme patients had, had, had shown, had painted. And it was just so telling. I was crying when I was seeing the, the art, but you can just see the desperation in this picture. And it is a pandemic of chron chronic multiple systemic infections. It is the potential plague of the 21st century, in addition to COVID. Um, it's a, there's chronic nervous system inflammation. And the Lyme patients often say, I feel like I'm being tortured. My life is terrible. I want a new body. I am suffering. I can't take it anymore. And sadly, there is a high incidence of suicide amongst these patients. One of my uh, Lyme patients who's very active in the Lyme community was so upset because one of her people, she was mentoring a young man did commit suicide. And so they suffer from such tremendous physical and emotional pain. And there is, and I've alluded to this twice now, lack of medical validation for this type of illness. And the family, even family members don't believe them. And they think that they go, they go, they feel like they're going crazy. And sometimes, and I have heard people say this, I don't know what's wrong with her anymore. She doesn't really have anything wrong. I think she just doesn't want to work. And she's volatile and she's changed and she's not the same person. That is so invalidating to the patients. One of my patients made a tremendous effort to go with her boyfriend to a function. But she knows that halfway through, even quarter way through, she's not going to manage and people are not going to understand. So they often just stop going to these functions and then they feel very isolated and very, very alone. One of my patients said, my doctor just doesn't believe in chronic Lyme and has its, it's his belief I don't have Lyme because my tests 
from the CDC were not positive. And I'm going to share with you with the tests and where to go and which are the best tests to have. And these comments show and reflect the torture that these poor Lyme patients have. And I work with them every day. And sometimes I cry with my patients. Yes, I do. Um, this was actually something that I just got from a post of one of my patients um, and her mother posted it and her mother has become her advocate. But I worry about the caregivers of the patients because they are so involved and the money that is spent is just unbelievable. And then I worry that the, that the caregiver is going to get ill as well. But this is it. When you have an invisible disease, it's difficult to argue from your perspective with ignorant people. I struggle with pain, mobility problems, fatigue, and the criticism of my environment every day. But people look at me and they say, it can't be that bad. You look good. Despite the fact that my body is experiencing excruciating pain everywhere, of course I look good. I try to look good but this is an invisible disease. And I learned very early on, it's about 15, 18 years now that I'm working with Lyme patients, not to say, oh, you look really good today. I never do that because they might've put themselves together to come into their treatment and they might have just had the most terrible two days and feel terrible. So I really learned not to do that. Um, and it's very often misdiagnosed. There is a South African woman here in my community who I met when I first arrived in San Diego in 1980, maybe it was a few years later, and I knew she was ill and that she'd been sick in South Africa as well. And then someone said she had rheumatoid arthritis and I always felt so bad for her. And we used to go out with them socially, she and her then husband, and sometimes she couldn't come, she was sick. 20 years later, she discovered that she has Lyme disease. 20 years later. So it is often misdiagnosed as fibromyalgia, chronic fatigue syndrome, because there are a lot of those symptoms. And actually, they usually all do have fibromyalgia. There's been so much stress. And MS, and then psychiatric conditions such as depression and anxiety. I also work with patients who have Durkheim's disease, that's adiposis dolorosis, and they, the symptoms of Durkheim's are very similar to the symptoms of Lyme disease. And a lot of times the physicians don't know what they've got going on either, and they give them tab tablets for depression, tablets to sleep, and for anxiety. This has to change. We have to be advocates. We have to spread the word so that there is knowledge. I am actually um, trying to get coverage for one of my patients. She has um, a Flex account, um, and we're trying to get the, the company to authorize treatment for me. Um, she has, uh, I, I really, when I was typing up her information, it was so sad. I was just crying. She has so many things going on with her. Um, and But on, the, on the, sh the sheet that I wrote up to try and get them to let me use this Flex account, I said nothing about Lyme disease because it's not valid. I spoke about all her other conditions. So isn't that sad? It's really sad. But we, it's okay. We've got all of us, all these wonderful people who do, who do drumming and essential oils and Feldenkrais. All of those modalities can help these patients because they need to have a multifaceted approach. I'm just going to show you my take on what I do with my specialty. And I do um, refer out to other practitioners who can help. So what you need to do, there has to be a differential diagnosis to decide, is this Lyme disease? And are there, are there any underlying conditions that coexist? What are the co-infections, which we will talk about? And some of you already know about that, and some of you may not know about the co-infections. But there can be heavy metal toxicity, environmental illness, which I spoke to you about, and the mold 
and Lyme disease co-infections or other infections. This needs to be clearly, clearly determined with the, first of all, someone has to diagnose and say, I think this is what's going on. We need to be tested. And then we need to test. So what is Persistobacterium? What is post-treatment Lyme? What is chronic Lyme? And can we eradicate this Burdorfi at low concentrations of essential oils? When we're through with this, I would hope that you can answer those questions. So as I mentioned to you, the standard treatment of Lyme is with a single antibiotic, either doxycycline, amoxicillin, or other antibiotics. And sometimes it will be rotated and pulsed. 10 to 20% of Lyme patients continue to suffer persistent symptoms and their fatigue and muscle joints and aches and brain fog can last six months or much longer. Actually, it's much, much longer than that. It's usually four years, five years, six years. I have a cousin who is in New York and when her mom, who's my cousin, who it was her daughter, came to tell me what was going on with her daughter, with Eden. I kept saying, you need to test her for Lyme. And finally they did. And they said she doesn't have Lyme. It was two and a half years later that she was diagnosed with Lyme. It is now four more years. She is functioning, luckily, and she is working, but she still suffers from a lot of what I'm talking to you about. And I found her a lymphatic therapist in New York and sent that therapist a blend of oils to use on her and gave the therapist a bit of education about Lyme disease. So I'm help, happy to help. I'm in this profession. We all have our business, we're earning money, but I am here to be of service and to help patients who are struggling and don't know which way to turn. And then there can be so many clinically, the absence of clinical detectable infection can be there. And so it turns into chronic Lyme, or we call it persister bacterium. In other words, it continues. If it's not diagnosed and treated early, which sadly is mostly the case, the spirochets can spread and go into hiding in different parts of the body. And weeks later or years later, they can develop problems with their brain and their nervous system and other parts of the body. And they can appear, disappear without treatment and different symptoms may appear at different times, but usually they do need treatment. And of course they are fatigued. They are so, so tired. Um, some people, I don't know how they work, but many, of, many patients have had to stop working. And so now we're going to talk about this persister bacterium. A new study found that a slow growing variant form of Lyme bacteria cause severe symptoms in a mouse model. And if that is what could account, the slow growing variant that could account for the persistent, persistent symptoms that are in 10 to 20% of the Lyme patients that who are not cured by the current Lyme antibiotic treatment. So here are some studies and the persistent form of Lyme disease can be lurking in the immune system once the disease becomes chronic. There is a man called Dr. Yang. He has done a lot of work um, on, on essential oils and he tested panels of essential oils for their ability to kill the persistent form. Those were very recent studies, which is very exciting. And they found highly active essential oils with excellent activity against biofilm and stationary phase Burgdorfi and at low, low concentrations. And they found them to be more effective than antibiotics. These studies have all been done in the laboratory. They haven't been done in vivo yet, but that's the next thing to come. But this is a great thing to start. And these are some of the plants, the essential oils that came from these plants that they used in the study. Oregano, clove, and cinnamon bark essential oils were used at low temperatures to eradicate this bacteria. 
And we all know that oregano and clove and cinnamon are very high in phenols. So they are the shock commanders of the body and they're just amazing. So that was amazing to do in low concentrations. And then Zhang also found some other active essential oils against the biofilm. And we're gonna talk about the biofilm in a second. Um, the biofilm is like a gluey substance that the, the Borrelia, the Borrelia uh, generates to shield itself from antibiotics and the immune system. And it can also hide, the Borrelia can hide in the biofilm and vice versa. So that's what the biofilm is. And then in low concentrations of just 0.1% found to be effective. They also used essential oils from garlic, myrrh, thyme leaves, allspice berries, cumin seeds, lemon eucalyptus, may chang, amorous wood, spiked ginger, and lily blossom. I don't know where they got the lily blossom essential oils because I've never seen lily blossom essential oil. Maybe you guys have. And then patients suffer from many, many symptoms brain fog, lowered immunity, inflammation, joint pain, sleep disturbances. And so can you think, and maybe you can share this when we do our break, what the, the modalities are that you do that you could help with any one of these symptoms. So we're not gonna cure the Lyme, but we can support the whole system and we can support them, even if we're just helping them with their joint pains or we're helping them with sleep. Maybe drumming would help them to just be calm and peaceful. Um, they get brain fog or they call it Lyme brain. I work with a lot of cancer patients as well. And after chemotherapy, there is um, a, a chemo brain where people can't concentrate properly more. There's definitely a Lyme brain. And especially if they have um, the, the co-infection called um, uh, the, the, some of the co-infections. It affects the skin, the heart and the nervous system and other co-infections in addition to mold and mycoplasma. So these are some of the symptoms that I just spoke about. In early Lyme, they get fatigued and headaches. They have the rash and sweats and chills and muscle pains. But in chronic Lyme or persistent Lyme, the fatigue increases, the joint pains increases, muscle pain, sleep issues, cognitive, and neuropathy and depression and headaches and sometimes they are heart related symptoms i'm just gonna have some water and that is very sad because it can affect the heart and there definitely is a side effect of that and you can see through all of these things i wish i was talking to you about something much happier but the happy thing is that we can help and support them is quality of life decreases. They can give up all hope and they can be completely depressed. I often will refer my patients to a hypnotherapist. I work with a wonderful hypnotherapist who really helps the patients just look at things in a different way. They can't function effectively at work and some of them become disabled and they cannot continue work. And then of course, anxiety and depression. This is the classic erythema migrans rash, which as I said, doesn't always happen. And often a facial Bell's palsy occurs and the knees and joints can become very, very swollen. So sometimes they first get these signs and they don't quite know what's going on. So now we need to talk about diagnostic testing because this has to change. The diagnostic testing doesn't work properly. And the most common diagnostic tests are the indirect ones. And what they do, they measure the patient's antibody response to the infection, not the infection itself, because the infection doesn't show up. The two most used antibody tests are the enzyme-linked assay called ELISA, we call it the ELISA, and the Western blot. However, during the first four to six weeks of Lyme infection, these tests are unreliable because the person hasn't yet developed an antibody response. 
So if they have they tested in that time, it will probably show negative. If you are infected by a tick, you do need to get tested. And also the Bay Lyme Alliance has a bank and you can take the tick and send it to the Bay Lyme Alliance and they will test it to see if it is infected and indeed what it has in it. So that's a fantastic service that they have. And later in the illness, the two-tier testing is insensitive and misses half of those who have Lyme disease. I have a patient who's working with a Lyme literate doctor. Her mother has Lyme disease, which is now been under, under control, but she's been on antibiotics for four years. My patient's daughter has Bartonella, which is one of the co-infections of Lyme. And my patient's doesn't have Lyme, but she does have Durkham's, and I think she does have Lyme, but the doctor keeps testing and retesting. He's the Lyme literate doctor, so he's using the right tests and keeps coming up negative. I think she has Lyme, but it keeps coming out negative. It's very, very frustrating. So the best tests are the Igenix laboratory in Palo Alto. There is another laboratory in Arizona called Fry Labs, and they're good for the microfilm. And then this CD57 is a specific group of natural killer cells that can be damaged by Lyme spirochetes. So it's good to test that. And if these values are below 100, it's an indirect indicator that Lyme disease is there. And it's the only, the Borrelia is the only known infection to suppress CD57. And if it's below 60, you know you both have Borrelia and probably mycoplasma. So clinical diagnosis, because if the testing is inadequate, we need to look and do what we call a clinical diagnosis. That is based on medical history, symptoms, physical findings, and possible exposure to infected ticks. My client who went to the wedding in Connecticut, she was exposed to an, in an area where there are infected ticks. However, a negative test result does not mean that the patient does not have Lyme disease. And there's so many reasons why they could get a negative test. Lyme inhibits the immune system. So 20 to 30% are falsely negative antibody tests. Or as I said earlier, the antibodies may not have come out yet if the test is done too soon. This is crazy, isn't it? In our, especially in our country here. So um, during the first four to six weeks, Patients may not have developed the antibody resp uh, response. And even later in the illness, the two-tier testing of the ELISA and the Western blot misses. It's so highly insensitive. So it is best, as I said, to go to the Igenix laboratory where they have more sensitive testing. And currently Lyme misses approximately 60% of cases and misdiagnosis, improper treatment, and long-term illness and death. It is terrible. So these will mask or aggravate the symptoms of Lyme. So the, this is a really, it's a travesty because these patients are suffering. They don't know. Many of them also have mast cell activation as well. So this was a study done looking at co-infections in Lyme disease. And they found that more than half of those with chronic Lyme disease have at least one co-infection and 30% have two or more. I've spoken a few times about Babesia. Babesia infects the nerves and the nervous system and the brain and the neurological system. Bartonella, which is called catch, catch scratch fever, um, it's actually not from a cat, and I know some of you have cats, it's not from a cat, but their patients manifest, they get these scratch lines on their body. I have a patient, a young woman, who's got those scratch lights on her body right now. Uh, also with Bartonella, sometimes in the middle of the night, there's a restless leg syndrome that takes place. It's usually at night. Olichia is another one. 
um, and out of 3,000 chronic Lyme patients, a study found that over 3,000 chronic Lyme patients had co-infections. 50% had one or more, and 30% had two or more of these co-infections. That's why this is also very difficult to treat. A, nobody knows what it is. B, it doesn't exist. C, the testing is not good. And D, there are all these co-infections and then once the person gets infected, boom, 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 boom. It's like the deck of cards just falling over. And what they do, these co-infections create cytokine cascades in the body. That's the, the inflammatory response that takes place. And that sends the immune system into an uncontrolled response, just like with rheumatoid arthritis or cancer. Every patient is different and presents differently based on their co-infections. So a standard plan, treatment plan is not possible. It has to be based on the presentation of the symptoms. And I know we're spending a long time on this, but it's very important to understand the basics of this before you know how to treat it. And also the understand the basics of how to feel understand your patient. So these are some of the co-infections. Mycoplasma, we'll talk about them in detail, Bartonella, Babesia, tick-borne relapsing fever, anaplasmosis, ehrlichiosis, and rickettsiosis. I'm going to speak about the first three because those are the most common ones that, that occur. So mycoplasma is a genus of bacteria that lacks the cell wall. So that is when it lacks a cell wall, antibodies don't function properly. So if you take, the they found that if you take sublingual doses, 0.03 mils of bergamot essential oil, there was a reduction in the mycoplasma. Sometimes the symptoms were aggravated as the patient dies off, it dies off and the spirochetes let off different cells, we call it a Herxheimer reaction, or we call it a Herx reaction. And that can take place. And that's when the patients get really, really sick, which is when I come in with my lymphatic drainage because I can just clear out all those toxins. Um, bergamot essential oil and its major components, limonene and lanolyl acetate and linalol, were tested against 42 strains of mycoplasma and they were all inhibited at a 0.5% um, dilution to 1%, the minimum inhibitory concentration. That's what they used from bergamot essential oil. Linalol acetate, which is an aldehyde, which is actually present in um, bergamot actually, and also in lavender, that was found to be highly effective as well, with levels of 0.015%. And linalol, which is also present in bergamot and lavender, had values of 0.015% and other against different parts of this mycoplasma. Limonene had levels of 0.03% against the pneumema uh, bacteria. And so you can see how essential oils can be helpful. And then the Babesia, which I've spoken quite a few times about, it's an emerging tick-borne disease caused by members of the genius Babesia. It's a parasite. Um, it comes from the same parasite that causes malaria. It's most often transmitted by tick bite, it can come from blood transfusion, and the clinical symptoms can range from flu-like to malaria-like symptoms. Patients who undergo immune disease, immunosuppressive therapies, and splenectomy can suffer more severely from these and even with death. So Babesia, the patients get really, really hot. They start sweating like crazy. They can't think, they can't concentrate properly. It really affects their brain and their whole nervous system. So I can always tell when somebody has Babesia. So 
these researchers found 10 active essential oils that showed more than 50% inhibitory effect at a very, very low dosage after 72 hours of exposure. So it was crushed garlic, black pepper, tarragon, palo anta, palo, palo santa, coconut pine, cajubit, and moringa. Moringa is a carrier oil that comes from um, Africa. Very low concentration, showed a good inhibitory activity, and garlic and peppermint, black pepper oil were the best in their ingredients um, with the diazole disulfide and the beta carophylline. These results are so encouraging, and it suggests that garlic sulfur compound DADS and the carolephaline can be promising drug candidates for the, inf uh, for the ability to cure Babesia duncani. That would be amazing if that could happen. Absolutely amazing. And Bartonella, which is the cat scratch fever, and it can lead to acute or chronic infections. So they identified 32 essential oils that had high activity, including four essential oils extracted from citrus, three from oregano, three from cinnamon, two from pelargonium, which is geranium, and two from melaleuca. Two active ingredients, carvacrol and cinnamaldehyde of oregano and cinnamon bark respectively, was shown to be very, very active against the stationary phase of this Bartonella. If you used a 0.01% dilution, you could eradicate all the bacterial cells, and we need to do more studies to identify the active components of some of potential essential oils and their activity against the Bartonella. So this is what we're looking for to have more of these studies. So in summary, aromatherapy is an excellent integrative therapy. And in the following slides, we're gonna show how to incorporate aromatherapy, lymph massage and detoxification into the treatment of this devastating disease. And we'll see what stimulates the immune system and which oils are for oxygenation. So the biofilm, there's a detective looking for things. Where are the bad guys? We gotta find these bad guys. We gotta get them out of here. We gotta knock it out and then build up the whole system again. But with chronic Lyme, the bad guys are the bacteria that are hiding in the body and the spirochetes hide in very hard to reach areas the joints, the brain, organs, and under the protective shield, which is the biofilm. So the biofilm is a polysaccharide matrix and it traps bacteria. The bacteria love it there. They can thrive and be very, very produce and make the person feel tired and weak. And then people feel very, very exhausted when that happens. So, this is what it looks like. It looks like a little corkscrew. Can you see that over there? Um, and they burrow and hide in the body's tissues. And as I told you before, it's a multi-system involvement. They have the ability to live intracellularly as an L form and um, also can be encoded as a cyst. The biofilm is a polysaccharide matrix that traps bacteria. And that's why a lot of times we can explain why it's so difficult to treat these conditions because of this biofilm that's trapping everything. So guess what? There are biofilm dissolvers in enzymes and in essential oils. So there were some studies done showing that the limonene, linal acetate and linalol in bergamot could be a biofilm dissolver. Peppermint inhibits candida and also its biofilms. You can't take more than 152 milligrams internally, so please be careful with your doses. And cinnamon oil can also break down the biofilm. It's a fantastic oil. Thymus vulgaris essential oil and the active compound thymol exhibit 
um, inhibit and eradicate the bioforms alone in combination with antifungal drugs against candida. So we can help to dissolve that biofilm. In addition to the essential oils, I work with enzymes and systemic enzymes are different than enzymes we take for digestion. If we're taking papayan um, or uh, what else do we do? Some papayan, bromelain for digestion, we would take it while we're eating, right? And would digest the food. But for systemic enzymes, we want to take it without food. So it's got to be 45 minutes away from food. And then what it'll do, it'll break down fibrotic tissue in the body and also help with biofilms. So because I said to you before that these biofilms are held together, there's a matrix and there's polysaccharides, proteins and extracellular DNA holding it all together. So they can be broken down by these systemic enzymes. And the enzymes reduce the density of the biofilm, dissolve the fibrin. They are what we call proteolytic. So they break down the protein and remove dead or damaged tissue, such as fibrin. And then microbial Biofilms cause a number of chronic infections that can't be treated with this antibiotic treatment. Once the enzyme dissolves the fibrin or the biofilm, then the antibiotics can reach the Borrelia. Some of the systemic enzymes I work with are called natokinase, seropeptase, and lumbrokinase. In addition to that, there are herbal biofilm dissolvers. And there is a man called Buna, and he has the Buna protocol. He also has written books, and he's amazing. What he wants to do is restore and support the immune system, stop inflammation. So cat's claw, which is uno de gato, Japanese knotwood, knotweed, knotweed and a lithro root which is a ginseng those have been helped found to help with the inflammation and help with the immune system and i have some other studies over there uh, bacterial biofilms and how to get rid of these persistent infections well aromatherapy for lyme and i'm going to go quite quickly through this when i'm teaching my classes we would go into much more detail about each oil but fatigue is rosemary is wonderful. It actually helps to strengthen and fortify the system. And then fever and chills, you can use all your chamomile and peppermint just to cool down the body. Headaches, peppermint, lavender, and melissa to be put a little bit on the head. Muscle and joint pain, rosemary camphor. Swelling of the lymph nodes, geranium. Nerve pain, melissa. Roman chamomile and skin rashes, aloe vera gel, but a really high quality aloe vera gel, the kind that I use has oxygen infused through it, together with calendula and lavender, that will be really good um, for, for, the, for the skin rashes. And then for back pain, sweet birch and peppermint can be excellent. Sweet birch can be very strong so um, do not use too much of it when you're making up a diet. In fact, peppermint on the skin can be strong as well. So when you're making up a blend, just use a low dilution. And then for mental confusion, rosemary and sweet basil. And th that would be diffused in the air. Neuropathy would be peppermint and Roman chamomile. And then lowered immunity, lemon and tea tree. I think after this one, I'll take a little bit of a break. Should we do that for some questions just to give you a little bit of a stretch break? Um, so I think we'll do that. Um, I'll just finish the slide. So we want to support the body's ability to detoxify the Lyme toxins through methylation. Many of the patients have the gene mutation um, H um, MF. MTFHFR, we call it the mother effer gene. Um, and so they can't detoxify properly. They can't methylate properly. 
So if we can support the methylation, we'll boost the immune system and increase energy. Fatigue is big in Lyme disease. So we can use rosemary, ravensara, aromatica, fabulous for fatigue. And then for microbial and fungal in co-infections, cinnamon, tea tree, and thyme. And again, you don't want to just put that meat on the skin. You want to dilute it in the right carrier and then put it on the skin. Um, defense blood sugar. Um, then inflammation and pain management. Roman chamomile is a nervine, so that helps tremendously with calming the nerves. And lemon actually helps to boost white blood cells. It helps to boost the white um, leukocyte formation in the body. And so does bay from the bay laurel tree. Thyme supports the antioxidant effects as well. And then for neurological and cognitive support, basil and rosemary are great to uplift the spirits and the mind and help with concentration. And then to treat mold and fungus, we can use tea tree, geranium, and cinnamon. And antifungal for a candida overgrowth, tea tree and palm rosa. Did you know that palm rosa is antifungal as well? And then the biofilm bacteria, tea tree, and geranium tea tree usually will go through that biofilm. We want to detoxify. We can use black pepper or juniper. Um, and then there's a neurotoxin cleanser with a liposomal glutathione and something for the virus. Um, well, I mustn't say the virus now. Um, an antiviral effect would be Epstein Barr virus and Melissa. And then immune system would be olive leaf extract, which is great. It's, it's a really wonderful herb. And then helichrysum is so anti-inflammatory, so, so beautifully anti-inflammatory. So shall we take a little bit of a break, Jennifer? Um, yeah, we can. If um, I've been watching the chat and there hasn't been any questions. But okay. if anybody because wants this... if anybody wants to unmute and ask questions, you're more than welcome to do so. Because this is a lot of material. So, you know, if you want to just get up and stretch, <laughs> do a little bit of a stretch, you can see my broken wrist that I've been treating with essential oils and comfrey and different uh, carrier oils. I've been treating this twice a day and with my laser and infrared light and Hopefully when I have my next x-rays, the, the bones will be connected. So, um, so any questions? Oh, look who's there. We have our buddy there coming up. So does anyone have any questions? If you do, you can just unmute. I can't see the chat from my screen, but if not, we could, we could go on. Or do you want to have a bathroom break or do you want me to carry on? Um, we usually don't take a break, so if okay. you want to Okay, oh, Marnie had on, just said maybe. Okay, I'm yeah. happy to go on. I'm mm -hmm. fine. Okay, so we will do that then. So um, we want to, in, to support the immune system. We could use lemon and bay. I think I really went over this slide. So, but mainly we want to address and treat the symptoms that are caused by the Lyme bacteria. We want to restore the quality of life, which is, as I mentioned earlier, very, very difficult to do. But my patients who come in for lymphatic massage when I combine with the aromatherapy, they come in sometimes looking dejected and tired and helpless, and they walk out looking so different. My girls at the front desk always comment to me, my goodness, what do you do in that room? So I'm not helping them forever, but I'm helping them get through all of this and then hoping as well, supporting the immune system, um, helping to with, or answer any questions they might have and just be a general, general support. And then the oils are magic. 
So sometimes a patient will come in and they just haven't slept and they're very depressed. So I will make up a blend of essential oils to help uplift them. Um, maybe I'll use some angelica, which is good to uplift the spirits and also for the lymphatic system. And I love to use Melissa, even though it's really an expensive oil, but the Melissa is a nervine. So it's great for these patients. Um, and it's also so calming to the nervous system. Um, so I'll, I'll make up the blend depending how the patient is when they come in because we really need to support these patients on so many levels. We spoke a little bit earlier about the gut microbiome and that is so important. And I'm sure you all are aware of that. When your gut microbiome is out, your 70% of your immune system is in the gut and your serotonin um, is created in the gut. Um, and so we really want that gut to be good. So we want to avoid foods that are high sugar because it will destroy the friendly bacteria in there. And we want to work on all of the detox pathways. Um, I educate my patient about the elimination channels in the body. And we try to work with all of those elimination channels. So the skin is an, an elimination channel. Um, and so working with the infrared sauna, doing dry brushing, um, those are really good. Um, and then the lymphatic system, doing lymphatic massage. I teach people how to do self-massage. And again, the dry brushing will address that as well. Um, the liver is also an elimination channel. The lungs, doing deep breathing helps to calm the nervous system, but also helps expel all that lung, uh, toxic uh, in the lungs. And, so, and then there are the kidneys. And we want to work having a lot to drink, lots of water. So working on those elimination pathways are very, very important. And then working with the fun fungus and parasitic, and we can't talk about all of that, what to do, but there's lots to do to support that as well. And hopefully the, um, the doctor that the patients are going to, the Lyme literate doctor, is addressing a lot of that. And then, of course, inflammation and pain management is very, very important. And with my lymphatic massage, I am addressing inflammation and also pain because we have what we call a sympathetic effect. We calm the nervous activity and bring up parasympathetic activity and then helping antioxidant and neurological and cognitive support as well as emotional support. And we can do that with herbs. We can do that with um, hypnotherapy, with guided imagery, with essential oils, of course. And so the lymphatic system is so important for the Lyme patients. And when we work detoxification strategies, we can really help with the patient and the lymphatic, one of the main functions of the lymphatic system, it's a waste management center. But it also brings in fresh fluids and fresh life to all the cells of the body. And the lymph supports, lymph, transports lymph to the lymph nodes, where it removes all the cellular garbage and metabolites and wall out red blood cells and other harmful uh, substances. When I trained as a lymphatic therapist in the early 90s, we were taught that 90% of the fluids from the connective tissue went back into the bloodstream and that 10% went into the lymph system, that the large blood cells that couldn't get back into the bloodstream went through. Research has shown us over the last four to five years, that is actually not true. 98% of all of the toxins and waste in that connective tissue get picked up by the lymph system. So it made my work and the work of the lymph system even more important than ever. And once the lymph nodes evaluate the waste, the, the lymphocytes get transported, they clean it and they discard it. And then it leaves the lymph nodes and goes all through the body and it returns to the cardiovascular system through the right and left subclavian veins, which are in the neck. We call this the, um, th that is the area where everything comes. We call this the terminus. So the lymph moves 
collects all the wastes from the connective tissue, goes through all the lymphatics, two different lymph node stations, which are under the arms, in the groin, um, in the breast area, the base of the, of the back, and through there, it gets actually cleaned, so to speak. And then it continues its journey until it's going into the subclavian vein and into the bloodstream. And it then goes to the heart and then it is eliminated via the kidneys. So detoxification, we have clients coming in to detox just having manual lymph drainage with essential oils. They don't even have Lyme. So, but detoxing is an integral part of beating chronic Lyme disease and minimizing the reactions caused when these injured or dead bacteria release their endotoxins into the blood. And they get a sudden inflammatory response and there's a flare up and we call that the Herx reaction. And a lot of times when patients are being treated by their Lyme literate doctor, they may be having ozone treatment, they may be having infusions of vitamin C or herbs, they will get what is called a Herx reaction. And when they come and they have manual lymph drainage, that can actually calm that Herx reaction. And we use oils of grapefruit, angelica, and black pepper. Now, if a patient is very, very, very ultra sensitive, I may not use essential oils straight away. I may go very, very gently. Um, but we use the essential oils and the lymph system with infrared sauna and colon hydrotherapy is really, really helpful because when I spoke to you about the elimination channels, the one I didn't talk to you about was the intestines, the colon, very important to eliminate wastes. I had a much bigger clinic than I do now. Um, and I had a colon hydrotherapist and a naturopath and a homeopath in my clinic, which I don't right now. But my Lyme patients would come, they would do infrared sauna, have a colonic, come and have lymph drainage, and it would be an amazing treatment for them. So the goal is to combat the Herx reactions, lessen the inflammation, boost energy, and improve sleep. So um, phase two de detoxification of the liver is really, really important. And glutathione is a really powerful antioxidant. And as I mentioned to you, many of these patients have a gene expressions and they have the MFHTR gene mutation. So they can't detoxify properly. So they don't detoxify properly with phase two of the liver. And so using glutathione can be very, very helpful because they are depleted in glutathione. Typically, it needs to be a liposomal form of glutathione or an infusion because the phase two is dependent upon glutathione. But the research has found that D-limonene, which is one of the chemical ingredients in lemon and some of the essential oils, it can induce both phase one and two detoxification that neutralize these carcinogens. So lime and lemon, which is really exciting. I won't go over this too much. You can look this up in your, you know, you can Google it, but these are the three phases of detoxification that take place. We have our phase one with our P450 enzymes. We have phase two, which is the glutathione. And then we go on and toxins are um, excreted from the body. Um, uh, we're going to talk a little bit about glutathione transferase because I did find some studies that actually help with that phase of detoxification. And then we need a lot of um, antioxidant protection, CoQ10, selenium, vitamins A, C, and E, and glutathione. And I'm a big fan of bioflavonoids and then also different essential oils. So for liver support and detoxification, according to Robert Tisserand's safety manual, um, the liver is the primary detoxification organ. So if we support the liver, we can help with metabolic detoxification. And because these Lyme patients have these impaired detoxification pathways, um, we need to help that go along. So if you can have something that helps this glutathione S transferase enzyme, we can help with this detoxification. And so according to Tisserand, 
these essential oil constituents induce the glutathione S transferase. And we'll just go back there for a minute. You'll see that phase two detoxification of the liver. Citral, which is an aldehyde, eugenol, cumin, grapefruit, peppermint, and thyme. So some of these are actual chemical components and others are the full essential oil. And that's on Tisserand and Young, page 55. Curcumin is really good for detoxification pathways and um, taking 250 milligram for 15 days, that helped the enzyme um, in the liver. Um, and I'm going to go a little bit faster because the time is going on and I want to have some questions as well. Um, and for the detox program, this is what I recommend that my patients do. To take Epsom salts bars twice a week, activated charcoal, which by the way, I had a whole protocol that I did after I did my um, COVID, um, uh, uh, in, not injection, uh, vaccine. And one of the things I did, I did homeopathics and I did activated charcoal um, straight after having the vaccine an hour later. It pulls all the toxins out. And essential oils of black pepper, juniper and grapefruit, colon hydrotherapy, far infrared sauna, lymph massage, whole body vibration. That's, I have a whole body vibration unit in my clinic and that helps to move the lymph and detoxify. And then you can check to see if they have the MFHTR gene mutation um, to help to see if they need extra help with detoxification. I also actually just got a red and far infrared unit that I'm gonna be using on my patients and actually to help heal my wrist as well. There are lots of herbs that are used for detox pathways. One is the Japanese knotweed. It cannot be used without knowledge. It really needs to be prescribed by a practitioner who has use of this, because who has knowledge of this, because these are very powerful herbs. And that inhibits nuclear factor kappa, NFKB, I could just call it, which is upregulated in Lyme. And that also is affected in the phase one, I believe it's phase one detoxification um, of the liver. I'm not sure, maybe you guys can remind me of that. Um, but this pathway is activated and can be interrupted by these phytochemicals. So there was a study done showing how turmeric, uh, curcumin, capsicum, eugenol, gingerol, anise, anethol from fennel, and basil and rosemary, the ursolic acid, actually helped to interrupt this and help with this detox pathway. So that is... Uh, the NF-kappa B is the, releases the inflammatory molecules. It's not actually part of the um, uh, detoxification pathway. And then for inflammation, um, there's chronic inflammation. And so we work with oils for inflammation like kababa, helichrysum, and the lymph drainage with lymph massage can be very, very helpful. Um, and then the lymph system is so important and deep breathing, deep breathing in and out from the diaphragm, the yoga diaphragmatic breathing actually helps to pump the lymph. I have all my patients do deep breathing, my lymphatic lymphedema patients and my Lyme patients. And then we want to remove the wastes from the lymph system by stimulating the lymphatic system. Um, lymph massage will help the sluggish lymph system and we start off weekly as part of a Lyme treatment. And then we add aromatherapy as we see that the patient is go doing well. If they are herxing a lot, I may only start off with half an hour and slowly ease into more treatment. I am a Dr. Vada therapist. So I do Dr. Vada's manual lymph drainage. Um, we reduce inflammation and we support the immune system. We reduce pain and facilitate healing and then relax the nervous system. And I'm sure you can see how helpful this all is when working with a Lyme patient. And 
we want when lymphatic drainage also helps the body we can use essential oils to help manufacture white blood cells like lemon or tea tree or thyme and assist in the elimination of excess wastes there are lots of oils that we can use for that angelica and carrot seed now this is really exciting i don't know if you all know that we have lymphatics in the brain and this picture came from a lecture that I attended, and it was in real time. You could actually see the lymph pumping. This is ICG lymphangiography, um, which is amazing. You can actually see the lymph, and you can see it pumping from the brain, surrounding the brain, the dura mater of the brain, and going down behind the mastoid process and all the way down to the clavicle. Um, the lymphatics are there. If you don't get enough sleep, you're not detoxifying from the brain. Our Lyme patients are not getting enough sleep. A lot of them have insomnia. So I work a lot on the head. We have this glial lymphatic system in the brain made up of the glial cells and the lymphatics. And that is very, very helpful. They also, many of them get terrible headaches, migraines, neck problems and brain uh, cognitive dysfunction. So basil and rosemary and lemon are wonderful for cognitive dysfunction um, that occurs. Um, there are oils that have antioxidant effects because there's lots and lots of free radicals in the Lyme patients and they have difficulties with cognitive, you know, and uh, uh, concentration and headaches. And so we can work with cineol, eugenol and menthol and essential oils of basil, cinnamon, clove, nutmeg, oregano and thyme all have antioxidant properties. And so does thymol and linalol and there are the studies. Aromatherapy for inflammation, we can work with linalol from geranium or lavender, delimonene, geraniol and really wonderful anti-inflammatory effects. Uh, we found terpenial 4 was also helped help also inhibited pro-inflammatory cytokines and lavender and bergamot can also help to reduce the anxiolytic effect and depression and this is a protocol that I sometimes do um, depending on the patient I do not always do internal use it depends um, but it can also be massaged onto the body. So a blend of thyme, clove, oregano, oregano um, melaleuca, altifornia, tea tree, frankincense, melissa, and cinnamon. One drop of each two times a day in vegetable capsules with olive oil. I like to sometimes put chlorella powder in there. Then you skip a week because we want to pulse. Then you go up to two drops daily for two weeks, skip a week. And you're evaluating all the time to see how the patient is doing. Three drops daily, twice a day. And then you combine that with manual lymph drainage, sauna, colon hydrotherapy, and taking Epsom salts baths. That can be a really powerful protocol. This is one of my patients who came in with Lyme disease, Bartonella, Babesia, mycotoxin, mycotoxin illness, she had hot flashes, brain fog, which was really mild way to put it. She was 27 years. No, she wasn't. She was 25 when she came to me. Severe neck pain, pain at the bottom of the feet, uh, like a neuropathy. And no one was understanding her, struggling with reading and writing. I struggle a lot. I'm in treatment right now, but I have some of my answers, which brings peace of mind. I'm so happy that I see Linda Ann. I've seen her on my worst days and she has been a light that I need to see. It's not only the touch of the lymph drainage, that's the MLD, which is amazing and beneficial for the drainage process, but it's her frequency. She has a high frequency that is felt and transmuted to me. MLD has helped me. I hoax afterwards, but then I know I'm doing some, she's doing something right. I must also mention she's not in the box. She thinks uniquely and determines the treatment that, I'm, that I need to have. Her heart is so pure. 
and then the patient's mom. Linda Ann, you are the gift that has been bestowed healing and love upon our, our darkest days. We love you dearly. I'm sorry to say that this patient, oh, she was 28, I, I'm correct. She was, she's still struggling. She's still struggling, it's been a few years. But um, I'm supporting her through. She comes in for treatments. Now she's doing some treatment in LA. It's very, very intense. So this is basically my integrative therapy. Lymphatic massage, emotional support, nutritional guidance, lifestyle, aromatherapy, education, support, and empower. So we're working holistically on all levels. And so that is the general Lyme protocol that we've been talking about, and I'm almost finished. Antiviral and antibacterial support, boosting the immune system, enhancing blood flow, improving memory, detoxification, overall health and well-being, fungal inflammation, antioxidant, and cognitive. And I'm going to go through this quickly now because it's nearly, we're nearly finished, goodness gracious. Dry brushing is wonderful to help stimulate the lymph system. Um, I studied with Dr. Bruce Bukowski, and these oils are what he recommends for the morning dry brush routine, thyme, carrot seed, peppermint, rosemary, and yarrow. Um, and then these are oils. If anyone wants copies of these, I can help you with these, but we'll do that. And so in, to summarize, Lyme is a multiple systemic infectious disease syndrome. The patients suffer from tremendous physical and emotional pain. There's a lack of medical validation and diagnosis. A multidisciplinary approach is needed. Essential oils can be a tremendous support physically and emotionally. Essential oils help to fight the bacteria, improve the immune system and detoxify the body. There is a potential to kill these bordalki at low concentrations of essential oils. We need future studies to determine if these highly active essential oils could eradicate the persister Bergdorfi in vivo as opposed to in vitro. And we must individualize our treatments. And I know this was a lot and it's getting late for some of you ladies. And I just want to thank you very, very much for your attention and wish you love and love and holistic health and wonderful tree of life and the ocean. And please, please spread the word about Lyme disease that there really is help. Um, that was when I was in the lavender fields, one of my favorite times to be. And um, if you have any questions, here is my email. Um, you can join my Facebook group, which is the Aromatic, War Aromatic Warrior on Facebook, ask to join. And those are my websites. And I thank you very, very much. And I hope that I didn't do too much for you guys here. Yeah. It was an honor to be with you. Thank you, Linda Ann. That was just wonderful. That was a lot of information, but it was very, very interesting. A lot of information. <laughs> so, so, and you know, we're all learning all the time. Another book is called Unlocking Lime. This is another really good book by um, Rawls, R-A-W-L-S. So, yeah. So does anybody have any questions? You're more than welcome to unmute um, and ask Linda Ann some questions. I haven't seen any um, questions in our comment box. So this is a lot of information that I have gathered over all of my practice and experience and compassion and working with patients. And truly, I've learned so much from my patients, so much. Hi, Nancy. Hey, Linda Ann. How are you? I'm wonderful. It's always well, good to see I you. I have to say, um, I, uh, I unfortunately, um, I was waiting outside for a delivery, and I was late coming to this. So I'm so sorry because I got so much out of the part I did get. I see that this is being recorded. Will that recording be available um, through West Virginia or through you? I'd love to see the whole thing because I really would love, I, I live in Lyme country. What can I say? I live in Maine. It, yes. it will be um, put into the West Virginia Wellness Facebook group. Oh, great. Uh, so when I get it uh, record, when I get it all 
um, on my computer, I'll be able to transfer it over to the Facebook group. Thank you, Jennifer. I really appreciate that. I, I always learn so much from you, Linda Ann. I can't wait to see you again. I know we've got to be in person soon. Soon. I know, because we've had some fun um, events, haven't we? Oh, we have. We've shared a lot of really lovely things. Um, and I'm happy to help. Um, if anyone has any questions to ask or that come up, you can always email me. I'm happy to answer them. And then I do do consultations as well online. Now that we, you know, we have Zoom, I have done a lot of consultations. I just was working with a woman in England. I worked with someone in India. Um, that, that was a while back, but yeah. So I have helped people online as well. Great, thanks. So it's, as you can see, this is just quite a devastating. And my little girl, the one that I wrote about, I'm so upset because she's having these treatments in Los Angeles that cost $8,000 for each infusion and what goes after it. And I, she's had three, her mom used up all her money, it's gone, and they had to do a GoFundMe for this. And I'm just praying, praying. And it's an interesting story because my one of my very first classes that I taught with Rodney Schwann, and we were officially teaching for the Tisserand Institute in San Diego, um, way back in the early 90s. And that young girl's mother was in my class. And then she became pregnant and she had this little girl. And so they've been in my life for so many years. And I, she's like my little girl. And then when she got ill, it was just, it's, so it's really, I've taken this one even more personally than some of my other patients. Mm -hmm. But she, she understands about aromatherapy. She actually raised her little, her daughter with aromatherapy and homeopathy from some of the classes. So. That's really interesting. That's awesome that, that, that yeah. she had some knowledge to yeah. at least get started. Yeah. Yeah. And I'm worried about the mom. Um, I brought her in several weeks ago for a massage at the clinic when her daughter was having a lymphatic drainage with me. We just gifted her a massage. I think we, we gave her two. And, you know, but to try and look at the caregiver. That's another whole discussion you guys should be having here, care for the caregiver. Yeah, I think that's really important. Um, I know with a lot of other patients that I've worked with in the past, not Lyme, but it's so important to also keep in mind of the caregiver and their well-being as well. Yeah, and all of these chronic illnesses, and often people just don't get diagnosed, you know, at all. So, very good. Well, thank you so much, Linda Ann, for your information. Um, like I said, our this chat will be put into our West Virginia Wellness Incorporated Facebook group, and so you can look for the recording. Um, and I'll stop recording right now.